these guys here trying to cross this bridge. Wasn't the best thing to do. They've been <laughs> massacred trying to cross the bridge by the enemy infantry over there. So what we're going to do is I've actually pre already pre-placed a smoke barrage to come down here. Now the smoke barrage is only work in progress at the moment, so it doesn't look too pretty, but it shows the, um, shows the effects. Um, so we're going to drop, drop smoke here and then see the difference trying to cross the bridge with some smoke. There, we've got, now got smoke. Now let's try and do that same move, crossing that bridge. So the smoke obscures the line of sight of the enemy, we can get across the bridge and we can start, um, we can either try and isolate one of the bunkers and concentrate against it, which is much easier to take out than trying to deal with covering some fire, fire from different directions. Um, so it can be used for various things, crossing open spaces, um, but generally it, it, it makes a big change to the way that you deal with some missions. Um, you can also bring the tanks up. And this guy here would have probably been shot by that anti-tank gun there, but he's now out of sight and now he can rain down supporting fire on the, uh, the guys in the bunker there. We know there's someone in there, but we haven't hurt him. Um, call in an airstrike on those guys. This, airstrikes aren't something new, but they just look good, so we'll just drop an airstrike on them. As our Stuka zooming fast. Um, we'll go into a bit more about the, um, the air model in a, later, because there are some changes to the way the air model works. Um, but that gives you some of the, the new rules there. What we're going to do now is jump to a major new system. Like they're all dancing. I'm going to look now at the skirmish system. Now, one of the, the most requested features for Battle Academy was a skirmish mode. And so Battle Academy 2 has a fully integrated um, skirmish system. Um, the maps are randomly generated, completely random, so you just decide what, you, what kind of map you want. Anything from tiny to huge. You can change the kind of environment they are. There's far farmland, wilderness and urban. Um, you've got winter maps and normal. You can change the kind of mission you want to play. So you can have attack and defend missions, meeting engagements, or symmetric battles. And that affects the victory conditions and the points. So if you've got an attack defend mission, you'll have um, a lot more points on the attacker side than the defender side. So the attacker will have numbers, and the defender's objective will be to survive rather than to do anything more. Um, you can adjust the force sizes, so you can have large armies on small maps, tiny armies on large maps, any combination that you like. Um, one of the really cool things we've done is, is add army lists. Now what these are, are historic um, configurations of troops. So you can, play, you can play random maps with just a complete random selection of units to choose from, and it could be completely unhistorical. You could end up with um, a JS2 and a, um, a Panzer II fighting each other. Um, so that, that's fine, people can do that if they want to, but what we wanted to do was provide more historical matchups. So we've created these army lists. What these army lists do, we jump into one here. Um, let's The army lists set minimum and maximum um, values and give you some um, points to spend. So here I'm using a German um, Panzer, is it Panzer Grenadier or Panzer? I can't remember what I chose. I think this, this is a Panzer um, battalion that we've chosen here, uh, 1943. Um, so it only lets you select from the kind of units that would have been available to a Panzer division in 1943. These lists can, are just text files that can be set up, so we're expecting people to create their own and they might want to create a specific um, company or regiment or any, any kind of period of history or unit that they want to recreate, they can create. So you set some minimums and maximums for each of the unit types, and then you get a certain number of points to spend. Um, and so it forces you to take a more realistic force composition. So I think I've chosen a tiny army here, so there's not much to choose, but um, I'm forced to take a certain number of infantry, a certain number of Panzer threes and then I have the option to take some supporting tank destroyers or artillery or um, yeah, another tank destroyer there. But it, it's a really interesting um, way of uh, playing the game. So I completely, this is a completely randomly generated map. Oh, blimey, I've, created the, I've created the largest map with the smallest army. So th this would be a bit of an unusual encounter. Um, let me just jump back a sec 
to do another quick random map. With the units, do you distinguish between the fixed art tank destroyers and those tanks which obviously could turn around in the turret? Oh yeah, there's, yeah. There's, there's different stats for those. I mean, obviously, one of the... There's a few different ways we, we make a difference between tank destroyers and tanks. Um, one is visibility. So the tank destroyers have almost no chance to react to anything at their side. Um, whereas turreted tanks have a reasonable chance to react to things at their side. Still not much chance on the rear, but they're much better at, at reacting to the flanks. Um, turreted tanks tend to have a second machine gun, so they tend to be, they, they have bone, more firing effect against um, um, infantry, and turreted tanks tend to be less affected by moving. So the tank destroyers were not good at moving and firing. They, need, they were kind of ambush units, and so they have big, big penalties to their chance to hit if they try and move. Whereas tanks, they, they're less accurate when moving, but they're not penalised in the same way as a tank destroyer would be. So those are the main ways that we differentiate the tanks and the tank destroyers. Thank you. Uh, sure. Let me just pick something. What am I doing here? Let's go through an urban map. They're always fun. It's created a smaller map here with a larger force. Um, so yeah, the, the maps are completely randomly generated. This one here, what I wanted to show is the way that co-ops handled. So the multiplayer system can be played uh, in co-op, and you can use random maps or pre-built maps. The, the army gets split. So you can see here that um, this is player one's force, this is player two's force. Um, if I was playing a co-op scenario, this isn't co-op, so I'd actually end up controlling both. But that's, that's how a co-op scenario would work. And then the enemy force would be um, deployed there. Um, right. Next, I want to go in to show the air, new air model. Okay, so we've added fighters into Battle Academy 2. In Battle Academy 1, you just had tactical bombers supporting you. In Battle Academy 2, we've added in fighters and air superiority. At the moment, the Germans have area superiority, then Mr. Smith 109 just did a fly past. Um, I've actually called in my Yak 9 to. Um, that's interesting. They've lost their textures. Anyway, I've called in my, my Yak 9, and so there'll be a little air fight at the start of my next turn to determine who has air superiority. If you call in airstrikes whilst the enemy has air superiority, there's a good chance that your airstrike will fail, it will get shot down or chased away. This is just a randomly generated map with um, stuff going on. So when the AI finally decides to stop doing stuff, we'll see who wins the air, air war. Okay, so okay, our yak has chased away the mission fleet 109. So we're now, we now control the sky, and whenever I want, I can call in my airstrike, hit the enemy tanks. So this is now a dynamic thing in terms of the control of the sky. Absolutely, yeah. You choose when to call in your fighter support. Um, the enemies can choose when to call theirs in. So there's two options. You can either use your fighter support to, um, in a defensive way, and save it to chase all. To, to try and chase away the enemy fighters, or you can call in your, your fighters first to try and give protection so that the enemy bombers can't come in. Um, it, it, yeah, it just creates a whole little um, extra layer to think about with the, um, um, just on top of the ground wall. So that covers the, one of those new features. Are there any ground units? So like anti-aircraft? Yes, there are. Oh yeah, I don't think I've actually got any, no one seemed to shoot at me here, but, um, yeah, you have a, a range of ground um, air defence units. You've got things like verbal wins and um, uh, 88 millimeter flat guns, and the British have got bofors and things like that. So yeah, there's there's a range. Oh, there's no British. 
The Germans have got, sorry, Germans, the Russians have got loads of anti-aircraft guns because at the start of the war they were really out um, performed in the sky, so they, they, they developed a lot of anti-aircraft weapons. Um, 